Okay, now I'm going to look at how, how the logical framework actually works. So this is the matrix that we've looked at, um, and in this case, it's, it's, it's blank. Now, again, what I'm saying, I'm going to say to you is this is sort of an indicator of how it works. It's a very simplified version of how you might use the logical framework. So the way you do it is you go vertically down from the um, objective, specific objective to desired out, outputs, activities, inputs. And then what you do is you look, once you've decided what your overall project objective, and we'll look in more detail at this in a minute, once you've looked at your overall objective, specific objectives, what outputs you're looking from the project, what activities, what inputs, what resources you need, you do need to look at what preconditions are uh, there in relation to your project. And this is really useful for a project planner. And the reason it is because it means at the very beginning of the project, all eventualities, pretty much, I mean, not exclusively, but this large numbers of eventualities in the project can be analyzed. So preconditions might be things like that you secure funding. Now the project may not ever happen if you don't secure funding. Another precondition might be that you get approval of partners to do a particular project. A precondition, so the, the preconditions really are the meta conditions that if they don't happen, this project doesn't move forward. And it's important at the very beginning to be aware of that. And it's important to point it out to the funders that if these things don't happen, and it might be the funding, it might be something else, that you are aware that the project may not happen if those conditions don't happen. Now, your, your responsibility is to minimize the liability associated with, the, with, with those preconditions. So if it is something like planning permission or if it is something like a partnership with another organization, you know, while it's important to point that out, what would be much better going into the next phase, which might be funding, uh, looking for funding, is to have agreements secured with your pro pro potential project partners or have um, planning permission secured. Um, sorry, okay. So what you do then is you go over and you look at the assumptions. Okay, so the way you think about assumptions is when you look at inputs and activities. I'll give you two examples. An input might be, um, sorry, an activity might be a training course, like the masters we're doing here. Um, and an input might be um, money to design the, um, the course. So you might need uh, a number of thousand of euro and you might need a uh, to hire a specialist to design the program okay so your active your your assumption is going to be that if you get five thousand euro for example that you can hire somebody to design and develop at uh, 10 um, lectures and you write that in as assumption because um, that might not be as easy as you think so at the early stages, you might say, and, and, and when you're saying, okay, we're making the assumption that we're going to be able to get somebody to deliver this program, um, maybe what we need to do before we go any further is do some research and see other people um, that we might be able to ask to do it in the eventuality that we get the project. And we might come back and we might find that there isn't anybody in Ireland that's in a position to deliver this program. We might have to go to England and that will make the cost significantly more expensive or it might make the mode of delivery significantly different. So the activity might need to change. It might change from a face-to-face -face course to an online course because you have analyzed your assumptions and the risks associated with those assumptions and you've modified your program um, to reflect what you've discovered. Okay, so that's, you know, the, the, um, the, the risks or the assumptions um, associated with the inputs, which are oftentimes the money and the people, becoming activities. The next thing is then you, you look at the activities, sorry, you, yeah, okay, you look at the risks associated with your activities and delivering outputs. Okay, so the activity might be the training program. So what I need in this program is that, say, 12 students uh, would complete the program. So my assumption is that if we run the program, if we recruit 12 students, that 12 students will, will complete the program. Perhaps that is not a sound assumption to make. Or perhaps um, what we need to do 
if we're analyzing into seeing what if students potentially can't complete the program for whatever reason. So what do we need to do? Well, maybe we need to look at putting more supports in for students, which might cost more money. Um, and we need to add them to our inputs. Or maybe it'll mean that we should recruit 15 students and give, give um, um, minimize the risk then if there is a requirement that 12 students would, would finish the program. So what I'm saying is that you analyze um, what are the risks and the assumptions that you're making that the inputs will become the activities, that the activities will become the outputs, and then that the output will secure the uh, the um, specific objective. So what we're saying, for example, if the specific objective related to this program is that um, games will become a more integral part of youth work practice in the three participating countries, um, is that is it is it is it correct to say that um, by completing the course alone that the games uh, will be adopted and, and the technology will be adopted in youth work? Or do we need to do something else? Is there another output or activity that we need to do in order to optimize the, um, the potential that uh, the output will lead to the specific objectives? And it might be that there might be two or three activities or four or five activities leading to three or four or five or six outputs that uh, secure one uh, specific objective. Okay, and then once you have all of the objectives, the outputs, the activities and the inputs completed and you've all the assumptions done, the next thing you do is you go down, you identify indicators from the top down. So what are the indicators that would um, verify the fact, for example, that um, that uh, games are more used now in practice in Florina, in Ireland and in the UK. Um, so the indicators might be that, for example, um, the number of young people using games or the number of youth workers using games within that, the, the, those three contexts has increased uh, significantly and we might say significantly it's increased um, games are used twice as much as they would have been used in the past so we need then means of verification is a survey at the beginning and a survey at the end so if you're doing a survey you need to put the survey in as an activity so at the very beginning of your project you need to do a baseline survey um, in order to assess the, the the level of use of games within practice among the different people participating in the program and at the end you need to do another survey there might be a cost implication with that so you might need to put in another input um, so what the logical framework forces you to do it forces you to look at how all of the different aspects of the project and it forces you to look at how they're going to be delivered both practically in terms of activities but also in terms of resources okay so the advantages of a logical framework is that it brings together in one place all the components of the project the activities the resources everything it's systematic concise and it's coherent and it separates out the various levels in the hierarchy of objectives which is important it clarifies it clarify the relationships that underlie the judgments. So it is enormously important to have your assumptions and the risks associated with your assumptions outlined. Why? So just say, for example, one of the key um, one of the key assumptions that we're making in relation to um, a games in youth work type program is that. Um, is that um, Minecraft, for example, will be freely available to everybody involved. And what if, as has happened in this project or in the, over the course of the project, that the, the, the course software has been, um, has been sold and access to it has been restricted? Um, so we mightn't have been able to predict that that would have been the case, but we should have, we should have, if we did a proper risk analysis related to the assumptions that we're making because a Minecraft potentially was such a core element to the project. Um, so even if you've had stated that one of the assumptions is that Minecraft will remain open source, or it's not open source, but would fr remain freely available, um, 
even if that changes, the fact that you've highlighted it as an assumption puts you in a much stronger position than if you need to amend your project subsequently because it, it, it shows the funder that they approve the project. Uh, you having identified an assumption that, um, that uh, they got a chance to review and didn't disapprove of. Um, so all of that is, is really important. It provides a base for monitoring evaluation, which we mentioned before, which is quite clear. And it looks at a multidisciplinary approach to project preparation and supervision. Why do we say that? Well, wh why that's important or why that, how that happens is that in order to put a proper logical framework together, you will need your finance people involved. You'll need people who, are on, who do understand evaluation. You'll need people who understand the project itself. You'll need people who understand the organization at a strategic level. You obviously need potential participants if you're going to do this in a, in a, in a participatory way. So doing out the logic framework in many ways needs doing it properly doing it in a participatory way uh, encourages you to involve a range of different people and expertise within your organization the challenges are it's not as I mentioned earlier a lot of work needs to have gone into um, into um, investigation before you actually do your logical framework a lot of people just do it as a box filling exercise they, they don't use it in the way that it's intended to be used and this adds that it's not used consistently and it's not used consistently both on the ground by community groups but also funders can be very um um what would you say inconsistent in terms of how they view logical frameworks and in some ways uh, community groups who put a huge amount of effort into them ca may not be rewarded because the the funders of professional do not understand uh, the amount of work that goes into uh, compiling a logical framework properly um, and um, in order to do that properly it does need to be properly facilitated and there are people who are just hostile to the logical framework um, and I can understand that some people don't like uh, the even the 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 analogy of uh, matrices in the context of youth and community work uh, and it does oftentimes get out of control in terms of size it can become very unwieldy okay um, and in order to address that there is a degree of of, of, of creativity needed in terms of the presentation of the logical framework. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly, actually I'm not, um, what we're going to do is um, I'm going to leave these to you um, and we look at it all again. Um, I'll, go, I'll go through a uh, build up of a logical framework or you can actually I mean it's it's no harm to to look at this yourself even rather than me just typing it but if you go through it on the on the PowerPoint presentation it gives you a bit more detail um, uh, so when you're looking at it um, this is a sort of another example of how you might do a logical framework so you put in your objective then you um, you put in what the outputs are going to be you put in the activities that are going to lead to that output. You put in the inputs, the resources that are going to um, have to be invested to secure the activity. So the way I've done this one is that you have a number of different inputs for each of the different activities. Now I haven't put inputs for activity two, uh, just using this for de demonstration purposes, but for activity one, there's three particular inputs. Um, and then what you do is you um, look at the assumptions that you're making in relation to the inputs and those inputs leading to, um, to um, the activities uh, being completed and then looking at the assumptions that you're making in relation to the activities leading to the outputs. Um, and then you're looking at a whole range of different assumptions that you need to make. So uh, the other sort of side of this is then if you look at the indicators and means of verification so if you are going to double the number of female owned businesses in Tipperary um, by 2010 then you know the way you indicate you, you, the, the indicator is the number of registered businesses and the means of verification is you go to the company's registration office it's reasonably straightforward it does take time does take 
um, sort of knowledge. It takes um, some money because you will need to get reports from the company's registration office and there is a cost associated with that. Um, okay, so I would encourage you to go through that um, in your own time. Thank you.